On behalf of the board and staff at IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you here today to our session on Toronto's future, who's paying, with our guest speaker, Chris Murray, the city manager of Toronto. My name is Enid Slack, and I'm the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Before we begin, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas of the Credit River. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I would also like to thank uh, the sponsors of the Institute, Havana Capital and Maitree, the province of Ontario, TD Bank Group, and the City of Toronto. I'd also like to thank our team here at IMFG who put this uh, event together today, um, uh, in particular Thomas Hatchett, our new manager of programs and research, uh, and Elisa Tate, our administrator. I'd also like to thank the event staff here at Monk, at Monk School, in particular, uh, Daria Dumbadze, who jumped in at the last minute to help us, and uh, Adam Bell, who's over here, and all of the technical staff at the Monk School. Um, I would like to ask that you don't use flash photography as we are webcasting the event today. Uh, if you were tweeting about this event, and I encourage you to tweet about this event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks, and our Twitter handle is at IMFG Toronto. Today's presentation is the seventh annual IMFG event with the Toronto City Manager, but the first for Chris Murray. And I have to say, possibly the most popular City Manager event we've had, because within an hour of the invitation going out, and you all know this, because you were there in that first hour, otherwise you were turned away, uh, we, were, we were pretty much full uh, within an hour of sending out the invitation. The idea behind having this event every year is to give us an update on what has been happening at the city and what challenges and opportunities lie ahead. We know from the presentations by city managers in the past that the city faces many challenges to meet the ever-increasing demands of a global city. It not only has to deliver what we consider traditional municipal serv services such as water, roads, solid waste collection and disposal, policing, fire protection, parks, libraries, but it also has to address the new challenges such as the impact of climate change, you know that one in a hundred year event that's happening much more frequently, the opioid crisis, the sharing economy, uh, increasing income inequality and more. And the city has to do all of this largely out of property taxes, land transfer taxes, user fees, and provincial and federal transfers. Today, Chris is going to focus on the future we want, what we need to do to get there, and how we are going to pay for it. What kind of city are we leaving behind for future generations? A scary question. So I'd like to introduce our moderator for today, and I am really excited to introduce Selena Zhang. Selena is the manager of strategic initiatives at United Way of Greater Toronto, but as many of you who've been here before know, she was the manager of programs and research here at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance. You ask how did we let her go and I don't know, she just slipped through our fingers. <laughs> and that's where she went. <laughs> um, uh, Selena was also acting co-lead of the uh, urban project at Maitree. Uh, before working on cities, Selena provided support to Ontario's migrant farm workers as community coordinator for Frontier College's Labour Teacher Program. She's also worked for the Cape Town local government in South Africa and ran an international health and youth empowerment charity. You'd think she's like 50 years old with that background, but not really. <laughs> Selena was one of the 25 rising leaders in the GTHA named a Civic Action Diversity Fellow in 2017. We are delighted to have Selena back at IMFG to moderate our session this afternoon. Please welcome Selena Zhang. Well, thank you, Enid, for that very kind introduction. And thank you to IMFG and to the city manager for inviting me to be here today. As Enid mentioned, the theme of this year's address is what we're leaving behind for the next generation. And as a marginally young person, I guess my role today is to introduce the talk with a few musings about youth and the millennial city. As with every generation and community, there's no adequate description that can fully encompass the realities of what it means to be a young person today. 
But I think that if you surveyed a group of millennials about the things that we want for the future, it turns out that my generation and the ones behind me want the same things that we've always wanted for this shared project called Toronto. My generation, like yours, imagines a city of actively fulfilled desires, of promises made and kept over time. Those desires might take different forms today as our climate changes, as the physical and social form of our city shifts, as technology continues to wrap itself around and through the way that we live, work, and interact with each other. Of course, one of the perennial handicaps of youth is that if history is everything that happens before you're born, then you're inevitably at a disadvantage. For better or worse, we are afforded by our youth the absence of historical context. We lack that intuition that gets built over time about why we do things the way we do them such as the tragedy of a time horizon, whether it's the length of a council term or a career or a generation or a lifetime. Can you learn from and build on a shared history without having lived it yourself? On the other hand, this lack of an intuition is also an advantage because we're not yet used to that combination of habit and precedent and risk aversion that often keeps us locked into certain policy grooves that others can find and follow with their eyes closed, even as the world changes around them. Time passes, contexts shift. The once marginal enters the mainstream and new margins get drawn. And in the long arc of history, this is probably what progress looks like. Every generation comes up hungry, it moves the dial and then it must stay vigilant to the voices that follow who are eager to point out what's been missed. So when I'm in need of urban inspiration, I often turn to the voices behind me, the ones that are curious and energized and skeptical about the systems that they're about to inherit. Case in point. There are over 100,000 teenagers on a Facebook group called New Urbanist Memes for Transit-Oriented Teens, <laughs> or NumTot for short. <laughs> and every day on NumTot, teenagers from across North America and indeed around the world post about their dreams for the city through mashups of animal gifts, and pop culture references, and urban theory. For every emoji-laden joke, there are threads with countless comments of teenagers earnestly debating how to make our cities more inclusive and vibrant and accessible. For every cat gif, there is a genuine moment of urban joy. The other day, a kid posted a cell phone video from the front of a subway train above ground going through his city at sunset, and he called it one of the coolest experiences he's had. Now more than ever, the sights and the sounds and the tools of city building are in a young person's pockets. And in these virtual spaces, we do what we've always done. We learn from and we debate with each other. We find peer groups and we organize around the things we care about. We create space for complaint and space to point out each other's blind spots. And we're having fun while we're at it. And isn't that what city building should look like at its best? Of course, as ever, the problem is less with the problems themselves and more with the tricky solutions that they call for. All of our imagining continues to happen in a world that is filled with real disparities in access and power and opportunity. And then the absence of a consensus around who should pay and how to pay for our debt to the future and to each other. Every year we watch as our city continues to stretch the short 
tight skin of its finances over the giant body of our urban dreams. Maybe, maybe it's true that young people have less skin in the game because they don't pay property taxes and they live with their parents. Or maybe young people have more skin in the game because the city is theirs to inherit. Well, ultimately, no matter how old you are, how we fare in the future depends on how we deal with all of this dissonance today. The soul of the city is a shared project, and the ghosts of its future are all around us. Ghosts called climate change and technology and migration and precarious work and poverty and concentrated inequality. And if my generation is to write a love letter to yours, let it not start like Adrian Rich's love poem number nine, which goes, your silence today is a pond where drowned things live. Our times do feel complex and nuanced, and yet someday it will be someone's job to summarize it into a high school history textbook chapter. And so for those future high school students who've yet to be born, what do we want that textbook chapter to say about what we did today? Well, as it stands, there's no better person to help us arrange all of this nuance and complexity into <laughs> tools and actions and questions and maybe even a roadmap for our present day than our own city manager. So here we are, ready to receive our annual reality check from the city's newest wonk dad, Chris Murray. <laughs> As the head of the public service, Chris resides not in the realm of complaint or gold standard, but instead in the realm of concrete solutions and their implementation. He's responsible for the operation of municipal government. It's $13 billion operating budget. It's $40 billion 10-year capital plan. It's 35,000 staff delivering 150 city services, making the city of Toronto this country's sixth largest government, and I'm tired even reading those stats, let alone thinking about what your workday might look like. Well, it surprises no one in this room that this is a precarious position to hold because the success of local government depends, of course, on the quality of the mayor and the councillors that we elect, but it also depends on the quality of the city's public service. And on the one hand, an effective city manager must faithfully carry out the decisions of city council. And on the other hand, they sometimes have to present city council with maybe uncomfortable truths about contradictions in their decisions. Well, Chris has built a long career and reputation on his ability to work effectively with both council and with staff. Before joining us in Toronto, Chris was the city manager in Hamilton. And during his tenure there, his initiatives included the development of Hamilton's waterfront, LRT, Tim Hortons Field, Go Service Expansion, and a downtown McMaster Medical Campus. He also established a results-based accountability framework, a citizen engagement charter, and a healthy neighborhood program. So without further ado, enough with this millennial jibber-jabber, and let's just get on with the show. I present to you Chris Murray. So my presentation will in no way, shape, or form be as good as that. <laughs> so let me start with some good news. I know Peter Wallace uh, talked about our financial situation as we're approaching a, uh, an iceberg, and uh, the iceberg's gone. Uh, global warming has taken care of that. So, uh, so <laughs> get in your sailboat and get ready. Um, my background is urban planning. I have a deep love for cities. I love being a part of, uh, of the groups and, the, and the, the politics of building cities. It's, uh, it's been a passion. My focus has been a lot on, in the early part of my career, on transportation um, and all forms of it. In fact, I was involved on the Shepherd Subway as a consultant years ago at Victoria Park to Scarborough City Centre. So 
Um, so I have a, an appreciation. I was uh, seconded to go for a few years to work with them. So uh, I get a good sense of not only the land use planning as an urban planner, but the transportation side. And then, and then I spent some time in housing. And um, you know, I'd often say to staff, you know, you can only get so emotional about asphalt and concrete. It's actually when you face poverty and you see what people struggle with and the staff that try to support them. And good people like all of us that end up in that state of affairs is, uh, is something to experience. So I, uh, I deeply cherish those, those days that I, I worked with. Uh, and I would often say to people, and despite what sometimes you think about civil service, I'm not overly religious, I'll tell you that up front, um, but if there's such a thing as angels, I think I worked with them. Um, this job as city manager is, uh, is not a career I had in mind. Uh, I think a few of us that have, uh, have held this role and uh, Shirley's here. I must acknowledge Shirley, uh, Shirley Hoy for all of you. I mean, you stand on shoulders of people. And uh, I, I sent out a memo the other day that uh, quoted something Shirley was involved with, uh, with uh, Mayor Miller about the structure of uh, Toronto City administration. And so sometimes you gotta go backwards to go forwards. And so uh, uh, Shirley has been nothing but uh, fantastic for this community. So. Um, with that, um, this topic is kind of near and dear to me. I gotta, and uh, I'll just say this and we'll get into it. Um, I used to have this third year public health class come and visit City Hall every year and seven o'clock at night, 50 faces and you know, they're pretty tired and you know you have them for two hours and you're likely gonna bore the hell out of them with you know, Civics 101. So I, I would always try and create a little bit of a hook for them just to see whether or not they're even paying attention. So I'd always say to them, you know, um, uh, by the end of this evening, I'm going to say something that's going to cause you to want to go home and, and maybe send your parents to their room. And, uh, and actually, I'd be a little bit more colorful than that because... Uh, <laughs> um, and then, you know, they'd kind of look at you and then you'd do your Civics 101, what municipal government's all about. And, uh, and then I'd say, what was that? And then they would say, oh, you're going to tell us something about our parents. And that's really what the focus of this presentation is. So, you know, as an urban planner, uh, you know, things happen when the province, you know, sets into motion population employment projections. And so, City of Toronto um, is going to grow in the next 20 years by a million people, about 300,000 jobs. Um, and to people, 20 years will seem like an eternity to the planners in this room, and there's a few great ones in this room. Uh, 20 years is tomorrow. Uh, that's no time at all to set into motion how you allocate that growth, which of course you do through an official plan how you supply the infrastructure to make it happen, which you do through master plans. Um, but the thing that really puzzles me about the, the dynamic is, is that we're not required to do human services planning, nor are we required to have financial sustainability plans. So we're good on the hard stuff. The other stuff, it's only by chance and by hope that something happens. And as far as the Greater Toronto Hamilton area is concerned, uh, it's going to grow by the percentage you see there. But if you break it down and look how the population employment is actually shifting, a lot of it is moving west of Toronto. In fact, in the 20 years, the population growth that's going to occur in Peel is going to pretty well match Toronto. Yes, some stuff is going to happen out in York, a little bit to Durham, but that shift in growth is all going to go west of Toronto. And it's going to actually outpace Toronto's growth by about four to one population-wise, three to one employment-wise. And so, you know, as, a, as the city manager for Toronto, I mean, I've never colored well within the lines. I've always kind of looked at things maybe a bit broader. So don't lose sight of this regional context when we start thinking about transportation, when we start thinking about housing, when we start thinking about how this economic region functions, because it is an economic region. And, and everything I'm about to say, I want to just tell you right now, if I had to choose any economic region to live in the world, this would be the one I'd want to be in, notwithstanding the challenges that I think are ahead. But uh, I think that's an important thing to keep in mind because, uh, you know, we can't think of transportation and housing just as a, a singular municipal concept. And uh, this is where we start, the aging population. So, uh, of course, you know, seniors 65 and older, fastest growing cohort. And, and when asked, 46% of them would rate their health as good to excellent. And we know in the next 20 years, those uh, 85 and older are going to quadruple. Those 100 and older will multiply by five. 
start thinking about the health care that goes with those. Now, those two people there are my parents. <laughs> two weeks ago, mom turned 97. Dad's 95. They live in their own home in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Uh, New Brunswick government saw fit to give dad a five-year extension to his driver's license. <laughs> so if you have this idea of going to Fredericton anytime soon, <laughs> You may want to drive during the day. <laughs> now, as much as, a, you know, from a health care, I mean, they do fine. Um, Dad will be asked all the time. He's a bit of a social butterfly in Fredericton. Um, he's in the paper every six months, and uh, he's a character. Um, these are salt-of-the-earth people. Grew up, Dad grew up in Melrose. He's from Northern Ireland. Mom is an Acadian from Shediac, and... Uh, they work hard their whole life, uh, blue collar. Uh, Dad has an index pension from the federal government. And uh, you know he, uh, they have some care that comes into the house. I have two brothers that live in Fredericton, so they're there. And uh, other brothers in the province and in Nova Scotia. And uh, you know, Dad's asked all the time, you know, how is it that you've done so well? Because he's very, if you were talking to him on the phone, you would not believe he was 95 years old. And uh, Dad uh, you know, attributes his uh, longevity to his income. Now, he's the cheapest person in Fredericton, I guarantee you. He has his first dollar. Um, but they've lived a very frugal life, and they, they feel totally rich, and they, they so enjoy being together and in that home. Now, Mom, last summer, fell down in the backyard and, uh, and couldn't get up. And so she, uh, Dad couldn't get her up because their, their mobility is challenged, as you would expect two people of that age. And uh, Dad tried to uh, get the neighbors aroused, but they weren't around. Ended up calling the ambulance and uh, told them not to turn the siren on. I don't want any fuss. And the paramedics came, and Mom was on the ground. And they said, are you hurt? She said, yes. And uh, they said, where are you hurt? She said, my pride. And uh, which speaks to a term that I don't hear too often, certainly in civil discourse or anywhere else, is you know, this idea of you know, pride or dignity. And so uh, they live with, uh, I would say, dignity. And so uh, that's, that's a term I think is important. Uh, healthcare expenditures, we right now, 44% of the provincial budget goes to healthcare, about 63 billion. And over the next 20 years, I think this is a very conservative estimate. Uh, it will increase by 50%. It will increase to 50% of the budget. And so when you think about all the services that the province provides, including transfer payments, it's going to put pressure on transfer payments, which are part of the story that we rely on. And so this is a very telling, concerning matter to me, and I think to hopefully to all of you, because as we age, you know, we are right now, and it you know, I was watching a program the other day, we're engineering new organs. You know, we have this concept of personal medicine where we're going to manipulate our cells or educate ourselves and they're going to start to be able to fix our problems. So we're going to live longer, there's not much doubt. But the big question to me is, is you're living longer, but where are you living? And what is that quality of life? And, you know, I will, you know, probably have a hip placement or knee placement and I'm going to consume that. Um, but now I start to think about, you know, how about the other generation? Now these two are uh, our children, so Hannah's here and the other one is Ben. Um, Hannah's 18, Ben's, or Hannah's 20, sorry about that. <laughs> uh, Ben's 18, they go to Western, and uh, they, uh, they, I think by comparison to many, I mean they have, uh, you know, they have uh, a life ahead of them, I think that uh, yeah, I'm sure they'll do fine, uh, but I don't think they all do fine necessarily, the colleagues. And so, I mean, we have a lot of millennials around the house. Uh, whatever stereotypes you want to apply to them doesn't fit to what I see on a regular basis. And the group, I got to chose, choose six people that uh, uh, I wanted to have here, and I'm really talking to them. And uh, they are people who are in this community that are wanting and are making a difference, I think, each and every day. Um, Edna and um, Osavoy and Happy and Dana and Hannah are all, in their own ways, uh, changing the world that we live in, whether it be through the Toronto Youth Council or here at U of T, or as a, as a former student trustee CEO. 
um, they are very much committed or interested in what we're going to talk about. And so um, I think it's really important that we start to just at least for a moment think about their lives and where our decisions are going and how it's going to affect them. So let's start with housing. Uh, you know, no great secret. I could spout out all kinds of facts about our housing situation here in Toronto. Uh, there's no question. I mean, you know, when I was contemplating a housing, Michelle and I, um, we could save for a down payment relatively easy. But that's where we are today. Uh, the idea of buying a home in the GTA is uh, 20 years of savings in order to have the 20% down payment. It's about, you know, about 12 or so years if you're talking 10% down payment. Um, that, just hold this thought in your mind as to if, if the concept of owning a home is something that's important to you because I think, you know, unlike our past, I think their future, their present is, is, is that even a practical reality? And I'm not just talking in Toronto, I'm talking back to this region and we'll get into that in a minute. You know, compared to 1976, you know, the deck is stacked against young Canadians and here's all the ways they are. So, earnings. Um, and just the economy. I mean, we all know in this room that there's been a, a strong shift away from full-time employment. Most of the economy we're staring at now is more than 50% focused in precarious, in other words, contract work, um, little benefits. Um, and if you have the experience to be able to get that contract and say you did want to buy a home, just when, even if you could make that home affordable, say three, 400,000, okay, um, and you go into a bank, I don't know if we have any bankers in the crowd here, I just want to know uh, if they showed up at a bank uh, with their three-year contract and wanted a $400,000 mortgage, whether or not we'd ever give it to them. Something tells me we wouldn't. Um, so it starts to, even if we you know, flood the supply of homes that are affordable to buy, who can buy them or who's buying them? And so I look at that shrinking middle class and I look at who's you know, obviously succeeding in this economy, and there are some, it seems to me there are more that aren't and that we're starting to see neighborhoods become much more racialized. And we're meeting with a group of municipalities this morning sharing what we're doing from a housing perspective. And, um, you know, the vacancy rate's around 1% right now, which is 3% would be much better. 1% um, allows the landlord to choose whoever they want. And so you start to find racialized decisions going on. And so people who ought to have a home uh, be able to afford a home are increasingly not able to be able to afford it, but there are other factors working against them. And so that job, that home, now let's talk about education. I mean, our kids are, you know, it's a given. If you're in university, pretty much you're going to be doing a master's because how are you going to make a living out of an undergrad degree? Um, there was a day when a high school certificate would work. And, uh, and of course, then with the debt, and, you know, our kids, I think, are very privileged. Uh, you know, the, we are able to help them, and they are going to pay part of their undergrad degree. Uh, they don't get a free ride. But, you know, at the same time, there are so many others that are challenged to be able to, you know, financially afford to even go to school. And so, you know, from a hope perspective, go to school, get a job. So I look at the job market, as I say, being precarious, and how do they get experience? You know, and then the housing prices. I mean, this is an average for for Canada. I mean, that 490, as we all know in this room, is pretty low. It doesn't even meet the average for condos, let alone single family. Single family is about a million and a half. And then, and thank God we're on the first floor and not on like the 19th floor, because I'm sorry, this presentation keeps getting worse, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the share and click economy. I mean, you know, honestly, you know, right now we're, we're in the Christmas season and the, the number of purchases are, are occurring through Amazon and all the other types of Amazons. You know, municipalities don't do real well with Amazon. In fact, what Amazon and that type of retail, what's happening is we're seeing the commercial retail sector suffer. The mom and pop businesses are failing where the kids get the jobs. And so we don't, only through very, very slim margins do we get any kind of revenue coming from the click economy. Sure, sales tax collected, but again, maybe through transfer payments, you know. Um, but the click economy, how's that working for municipalities across this country? Um, and how's that helping this generation that I think we should be a little concerned about? 
the share economy, we do a little bit better there. I mean, there are ways to license things. We get a little bit more money, but again, you know, it's another transformation in the economy and, and who's better off. I mean, I heard a great thing the other day on CBC about musicians that, you know, their music is on Spotify and how they can't really make a living anymore. So, you know, again, if you had those dreams, you know, uh, think long and hard, you better be prepared to go on the road to push the album or to make your dollar because you're making just a fraction of a cent on these uh, digital music means. So, you know, that, that to me, I think, is another reason to be incredibly concerned. And like I say, I mean, the financial iceberg that we talk about, you don't have to worry about because global warming is well in hand. And so we're experiencing all the consequences of that. And so preparing for the kinds of shocks in the environment, like we're seeing out in California, like we're seeing all over the world, you know, enterprise risk assessment or re re resiliency plans are becoming the norm. And so, you know, budgeting for, now we're beyond fixing the roads and all, we're now budgeting for how do you budget for those kinds of events when they occur? And who's paying for that, you know? So it starts to add up and then, and then you take it to the next, uh, whoops, just come back for a second. The road ahead, there is a road ahead here. <laughs> if I can just go backwards here. Uh, there we go. If I stop playing with the button, we'll be all right. Um, and this just gives you an idea of what's happening in our city right now in terms of where spatially high income, medium income, and, and lower income uh, resides. And gives you a sense where it's concentrated. And you can, if you had a transit map that I could overlay on this, you'll see in the low income areas that uh, there isn't as much transit opportunity as you see in the areas that are certainly middle and higher income earning. So all of that. Um, I think is, is, you know, presenting, I think, even more challenges for ha us to, to think about and how to figure out. And, and I keep coming back to the fact that the people that are in this room that I certainly invited and I'm glad are here, I know in elections typically don't show up and vote, and, and there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. And I worry as baby boomers, uh, you know, I'm at the tail end. I mean, I, we, we will be selfish, uh, we will look after our own, we will trade off hip replacements and knee replacements for bike lanes, I worry, unless there's the, obviously the courage, the conviction you have of decision makers to make those investments. Um, I think that's, you know, I think that's, you know, some of the problems that we're facing here. And so, you know, how do you, how do you put all this in perspective and move ahead? And so with that, the road ahead, let me just say this, um, my job, I think, is pretty simple. As much as this is a very complex situation that we're facing, I would say my job, in some respects, can be explained through this metaphor. I, I am a hired driver. At the, uh, I'm not an Uber driver. I don't have 100 destinations I'm going to. Uh, I am not an Indy driver or an NASCAR driver. I don't go around in circles. I'm a driver that's been hired to get to a destination. Now, when you look at that picture and you see that rear view mirror, um, that's obviously reflecting everything that's behind me. I look at that as the stuff that's important, but that's behind, that's the past. If you try to drive that car staring at the past, you will crash. That mirror is of a certain size for a reason. It's not six foot wide, it is only about a foot wide. I have regard for it, I have to know where we've been to know where we're going, but I am not driving the car looking at that. Now I'll tell you right now, the car, I don't own, the destination I don't own, and the gasoline in the car I don't own. Council and the mayor owns it. Where this car goes, who owns the car, who puts gas in it, is the decision of council. And I deeply respect that role. Now, if you look at where my hands are on the steering wheel, and of course a foot on the gas and on the brake, but the other thing that's kind of through that steering wheel is this dashboard, and that's, that gauges the performance of a car. I am, as funny as an urban planner, how I ended up having a passion for performance as I can't explain entirely, except that I care about how something runs. And so I have to have regard for the speed, the heat, the oil, you know, the amount of gas in the vehicle to get us to the destination. And I'll talk about that destination in a moment. But I have to have regard, I can't stare at that, gas, that dial, but I have to have regard for it. So how an organization performs matters to me. The steering wheel, the gas pedal, and the brake is something that I can, I can use when I have to react in a, in a moment's notice. And I have to keep everything kind of 
heading towards a future, a, a forward position. That forward position is really what council, through this election, is going to tell me they want me to focus on. So imagine when people describe their aspiration, council has a responsibility to demonstrate leadership towards those aspirations. When council turns to myself and the administration and says to us, you know, we direct you to do the following, take focus on the following priorities, we come back with a way in which to accomplish that, a strategy. My, re my responsibility back to that citizen is to provide services in a, in a valued way. And that's really the relationship between these three entities, the people, the politicians, and the administration. I provide value for money for the services people want. Council asks me to make sure that we get to where we need to. And, and of course, you know, the citizenry tells council what their aspirations are. My focus is really simple. I stumbled upon this when I started in Hamilton as city manager. I said I was going to spend a third of my time in the three areas. So a third of my time building a relationship with the mayor and council. I go nowhere without having a positive, strong relationship with the mayor and council, all 25 and the mayor. Each has a vote, okay? Um, so that is how I function in Hamilton. That's how I'll function in Toronto. This is the first thing I have to establish and is to build that relationship and that relationship is built on two basic things, you know, respect and trust. And I don't assume it, I'm gonna have to earn it. Just because I have the title doesn't mean the relationship is there, but I will try and build that relationship. I could come up with a way to turn lead into gold and it wouldn't matter if council didn't wanna to listen to the advice of myself and all my colleagues. Staff and institutions, this is the next third of my time I spend. Um, when I say staff, I mean both my leadership and my front line, critical to me. Anyone that knows me will see I do videos. Um, my first day of working for the City of Toronto, I sent out a video, to, uh, video uh, an email to all 35,000 staff uh, with a little video, uh, two and a half minutes long, explaining who I was uh, and why I was excited to be here. And at the end of it, I asked them a question I said, you know, our family is big on food. We love restaurants. The restaurant scene in Toronto is magnificent. When we were here 25 years ago, we thought it was good. Now it's ridiculous. And, uh, but, you know, I don't know the scene all that well. I said, could you recommend a restaurant? Now, when you ask 35,000 people <laughs> to recommend a restaurant, I got 500 recommendations. Two weeks later, I had it all tabulated, and I sent it all back to them explaining that the two weeks that I'd been in, in the office, that uh, the welcome had been fantastic. And this is from union leadership, this is from our front line and from the leadership itself. And, uh, and I gave them the spreadsheet, the 500. So, you know, it, it's, it's just a way to connect and I think it's really important. All I'm trying to do with them is just simply thank them and show them respect because I'm just, again, I'm gonna tell you they're far better than I think you read about or hear about. And I'll defend that as long as I'm here. Performance and priorities is really the last piece that I focus on. I really want to demonstrate that the 150 services that we provide are done extremely well. No matter if it's transit or housing or modernizing government, whatever the story happens to be, the priorities that council is going to give us, I go, if I can't make sure the lawns are cut, the garbage is picked up, the roads are fixed, all the basics, day after day, because these elected officials no one is coming to them and saying, my God, you got to get on with that intergenerational equity. <laughs> not happening. That's not what they're saying to them. What they're saying to them is, you know, where the heck is the garbage collector? And, uh, you know, and, and if I can't, if our organization can't do that incredibly well, I don't get to have the fun that I really love, which is working with them to kind of change the direction of the city. And I'm meeting with every one of them right now, and my comment to them is, is that if we were to have this meeting in four years, because I'll tell you, I say this to all my, all my leadership and all my front line, and I have one of my counselors right here, uh, Councillor Perks. Um, I have no idea why you run for office, to be completely honest. It is the most, anyone that's worked with a municipal politician up close, I mean, really, if you, have, you have no idea what they go through. If it's Saturday morning and they're at a grocery store and someone approaches them, the chances of that someone saying something wonderful to them is... 
And that, honestly, there's a call it whatever you want, an empathy or whatever. I'm going, if you're going to run the gauntlet for four years as an elected official and take the slings and arrows, because God knows we love doing it, you know, I'm just secretly saying to him, I just want us in four years to be able to say we moved the dial. And, and I'm convinced we can. And, but it's only because of that relationship and, and staff giving them very good information. You know, you know, and, and I've been hearing, you know, there's always this worry that it's, the, the reports are sometimes angled politically. I'm going, you want us to have courage to always give you the best advice we can. And I think we do that. And we saw evidence of that when we had the 47-25, 47-25 debate. You had a city solicitor who I think is remarkable. You know, you had a clerk who I think is remarkable. In fact, world class. People come to Toronto to not only, you know, work with these people, but, you know, have them advise elections around the world, you know. You have a chief building official. You have a medical officer of health who's a true hero. You know, that's, I mean, I did my home before I ever came here. I want to know who would I be working with. So, you know, and then I have a group of DCMs, which I dearly love. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's a very good group. And you want us to be courageous. And you want us to be brave. And you want us to give you the facts and only the facts. And we'll let the politics deal with it the way they are. But they're much better than I think many people give them credit for. I love priorities. Please, please, please don't give me 30. Okay. I know. I'm sorry. You're the only one with. Uh, oh, my God. See, that's the first sin of a city manager not to recognize all members of council. But um, yeah, I, I work well with a few priorities, especially big ones that we can, you know, put together the kinds of groups that we need to, to make things happen. So I, I look forward to that discussion. Uh, our budget, you know, total about 13 billion, uh, 8.75 uh, is stuff that I have certainly direct control over. Uh, agencies, not so much. I mean, they're guided by boards, but it's 4.2 billion. Um, again, we're talking police, we're talking, uh, you know, Toronto housing, we're talking TTC, you know, a sizable budget. And this is how the revenue is broken up. I mean, the big ones here, as you can see, are user fees and property taxes and then grants. And as I said earlier about the health care uh, costs only going one direction, I worry about how those subsidies are going to be allocated. I think something really important to know is that metropolitan census area, which is obviously Toronto, but it's York and it's Durham, it's Peel and it's Halton. When you look at that mass from a GDP standpoint, the GDP of that mass is equivalent, just about exactly equivalent to Alberta, and is just about exactly equivalent to Quebec. So it generates a tremendous amount of taxes for this country, and certainly for this province. And I am no way, shape, or form suggesting, you mean hinting or anything about breaking <laughs> away. But I think what it really speaks to is, is that the importance of urban areas, and certainly urban regions, and looking to make sure that the quality of life that it gives, exists in those places, and that's certainly informed by transit, it's informed by housing, it's informed by the economy itself, is never lost sight of because this urban area does a lot for this country. And Toronto, I think, as a kid from New Brunswick growing up, I mean, we always knew where Toronto was. And we always knew, you know, there was... Like when I saw Stelco the, for the first time, I know a lot of people would think of it environmentally, you know, what a disaster. I saw jobs. You know, go live in a part of the country where you have to line up for a, a minimum wage job and uh, understand that when you see Southern Ontario, you know, to a kid from the Maritimes, it's like it's a big deal. Always has been, certainly is, but I think that future needs to be focused on not just by the municipality, but I would say by the province and by the federal government. And so, of course, you know, what's the presentation from the city manager without the Gartner Expressway? <laughs> and I am not here to suggest for a second that all the debate and the direction, I fully respect where council is at with its, its, its view of the Gartner and the challenge. You were not the ones that decided to build it. Uh, you were not the ones uh, that thought it was a great urban idea. Um, the thing that was a little curious to me, though, as an outsider coming in was from a lane kilometer standpoint, I was interested is what percentage of overall lane kilometers does that road consume? It's 1.3% of total lane kilometers. From the you know, a state of good repair transportation budget perspective, 
just I'll ask you, I said, what percentage of our state of good repair budget, transportation budget for the next 10 years do you think that that road is consuming? Okay, you, you know that's totally cheating. No, we will not do that. But just, you know, in the audience, just take a wild guess. What percentage of our ten, next 10 year budget? 20? 53. Okay. So, and that, and, and which of course begs the next question, and that is, and, and this is the infrastructure person in me. Um, asset management is incredibly important. Uh, it begs the question, you know, with a road, roads are simple things. When they crack, if you don't maintain them, what happens is that water will penetrate into the base, the freeze thaw will blow apart your base, and next thing you know, you're replacing your roads. And that's a very expensive thing. So longevity of a road ought to be at least 60 years if it's maintained properly, and eventually you've got to make that big payment to replace it. Now, not to say that we are coordinating our infrastructure, our subsurface infrastructure is coordinated with our, so pipes and all, we, we do coordinate that quite well. But, you know, all I'm saying is if a road goes down prematurely, you know, who's going to pay? And I, I hate to keep looking at our friends over here. It's a responsibility that we have to look at the infrastructure we own and try and maintain it. And I'm not going to suggest you put it on the backs of, of the city of Toronto. We have a responsibility, and we are seeing infrastructure investment come from the federal government, the provincial government. We are seeing, and, I, and you know, as much as I think you have to be grateful for what you do get at the same time, you know, we are getting investments from the federal and provincial government. They're, they're somewhat piecemeal, I would say, somewhat ad hoc. And at some point in time, you know, you would love to go back to whoever had the idea of maybe an urban affairs agenda. And so just a few suggestions as a wrap up. Um, I worked on a project in, Red, in, in, in Hamilton that was a, a road project that was 55 years in planning, design, and construction, which, you know, uh, a person I met, or a group I met from Mongolia said, you know, maybe that's one of the benefits of a communist government. But, uh, you know, and I said, well, I prefer our government. But, I mean, 55 years, there was civil disobedience, which was completely understandable, and we ended up negotiating eight agreements with the Haudenosaunee. And one, you know how sometimes in meetings there are things that you hear that you never forget? Um, I actually got a whole gold mine of stuff working with the Haudenosaunee representatives. But the one thing that really stuck out was they were saying that in their history, in their way, in their culture, they don't think about, you know, decisions from a generational. They think about decisions in a seven-generational context. And so... You know, as much as that we're, we're trying to reconcile the way we treated our indigenous people, um, you know, I would suggest that the learnings that we could actually enjoy from them are, are immense. And the idea of generational thinking as we look after the garbage, mow the lawns, all that, don't lose sight of that. The pay me now or pay me later, and I know there's a few people in this room will remember the commercial 1972, uh, the Fram oil filter commercial where the, the mechanic you know, holds up the Fram oil filter and says, you know, for $4, we could have avoided this $300 bearing job. Basically, you can either pay me now or pay me later. And I look at the investments that we need to make in our neighborhoods. And I look at the people that are struggling in poverty. I look at the millennial generation that's coming along in their future. And how do we ensure that, you know, people's quality of life, and I go back to my mom and her dignity. And I wonder, you know, how is it that we can maybe start to look at these neighborhoods and, and start thinking about outcomes? Now, I'm going to say this, that I've had an opportunity in the last three months to look at the programs that the City of Toronto has, that Council has supported. And, and, and the social procurement policy itself, I'll tell you right now, is from a municipal uh, standpoint, is, is absolutely revolutionary. It is something that is, you know, deserves to be applauded. Now, in terms of how mature is it, it is, it's got work to do, there's no question. The investments that need to be made in it are important. But, you know, certainly the idea of taking the $1.3 billion that we spend on goods and services and looking at ways in which that money can be allocated to uh, start to address some of the inequities that are in our community, I think, is, uh, is applaudable. I was in Cleveland working with the Cleveland Foundation there. A group of us went down. Um, they leverage from the hospital system in Cleveland uh, both food supply and, and laundering and all the kinds of, uh, you know, 
uh, 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 hospital bed care that they have. In other words, what they've done is they've taken half of the money that they spend on those two services and they've created uh, uh, social projects in, in Cleveland uh, to advantage people who wouldn't otherwise have uh, full-time employment. They provide these individuals financial training to give them assistance in terms of acquiring housing. And it's a way in which that you get the things that you need done as an institution, but you'll yet still benefit your community. So I, I think that that's important. Um, and, I, and, I, and I look at the work that the, uh, the Toronto Youth Council has done. Uh, there is a, a number of actions I know of, some of which we have completed, some that we still have more work to do and we'll need some financial support for. Um, I know they talk about unemployment and uh, the fact of the matter is, is that uh, you know, we have a very high percentage of, of youth that are, I think is in the order of about 40% that are trying to find work and the ex the problem that they have is related to gaining the experience to get the job and you can't get the job without the experience and I would like to think we can solve some of that. Institutions need to be more outcome driven and demonstrate value for money and what I'm saying there was uh, we did have an experience um, in Hamilton and I see some of it happening certainly here in Toronto but we had something called the Hamilton a a anchor, uh, Leadership Anchor Institute and what it was was the CEO of the Linz, the CEOs of the hospitals, of the, of the university, the college, the school boards, the chamber, the poverty round table, the Hamilton Community Foundation ourselves. We met four times a year. We had a focus, ours was housing and hubs. And we all agreed that we would have no letterhead or logos because that means more bureaucracy and none of us want more bureaucracy. Uh, we said we'd be outcome driven. And if we didn't get something done in four years, we'd quit meeting. And so that actually led to some work that's been done in developing a, a hub in the East End of Hamilton, which will be, its focus will be Indigenous people's health. Um, we have been able to kind of collaborate on, on housing work that is uh, unfolding. Um, an offshoot of that was, and I used to be CEO of City Housing Hamilton, and uh, I'm telling you, um, at the risk of sounding whatever, um, I think we're warehousing people. Uh, I was, I was, you know, I couldn't believe the 14,000 people that were in our system in Hamilton. I had seven social workers. You know, the pay me now, pay me later. If I can deal with the challenges that are in our buildings in terms of, you know, dealing with the mental health issues, the addiction issues, you know, that will curtail some of the drive or the demand that's occurring in our emergency wards. Uh, that will help to address some of the problems of doing uh, hallway medicine. Uh, that will help me curtail the amount of need I have for paramedics. Um, you know, that, that pay me now, pay me later thinking is, is there's solid evidence to indicate that if you invest in the proper services that you can avoid those end of pipe, more expensive outcomes that occur. And so that's something that I think, but I think having an outcome driven focus is incredibly important. Um, I, I think we celebrate too often plans and strategies. And to someone who's homeless, you know, if you say to them, you know, I have a plan, and they go, I would like a blanket, you know, um, never lose sight of that. I can tell you in the 25 years that I haven't been here, um, the thing that probably disturbs me the most is, is just walking to City Hall and seeing what's happening on our streets. And uh, I think that is something that institutions, and I mean not just, you know, universities, but I do mean hospitals, I do mean the other levels of government, you know, we need to, and we have action plans for neighborhoods, but I, I have gone through them. And there's a lot of great collaboration, a lot of important work going on. I'm not in any way, shape, or form taking anything away from that. But I think we need to look at them from an outcome basis too. You know, what is it that ultimately all of our programs, and the best way I can explain it is that if I ran a business that produced widgets and you were the shareholders, and I came to you at the end of the year and I said, I generated 100,000 widgets, you'd probably go, oh, that's pretty good. And if I said it was 100,000 widgets that were of the highest quality, you'd go, okay, that's, that's probably not so bad. And then if I, someone said, well, you know, the market requires widgets. That's 100,000 high quality widgets in a market that requires widgets. I think knowing what your outcomes are incredibly important. And I think that's something that uh, increasingly, and, and when I look at what our medical officer of health is, is looking at in terms of population health, and, and I think they have done some outcome uh, focus, which I think is, 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 is great. I think we could probably go maybe even a bit bigger and, and fold into that education and other things. Our social procurement community benefits opportunities I've addressed. I think they're, uh, you know, I look at, the, we have a deal with the casino, I know, for community benefits. And, uh, 
there is some return there, and I know our social procurement program is being looked at. We have an uh, Anchor Toronto group that uh, involves universities uh, in their procurement, so we have policies that we're able to extend to these other institutions to utilize their spending in better ways. And then I'll end with this, you know, pick a few priorities and deliver. Um, that's why I came here. I mean, at the end of the day, it would be easy for me to have stayed in Hamilton. Um, but when Michelle and I came to Toronto in 1987, we fell in love with the place. Um, we were at the Horseshoe and the Omicombo just about every weekend, and my friends from Scarborough, I, they never did anything. I could never understand that. I mean, I was busy enjoying the, uh, the culture and the life of Toronto, and, uh, and you have such an incredible city. I mean, we, we travel all over the world, and I love cities, and, and I, you know, everything to me keeps coming back to Toronto and where it's at and where it's going. And so with that, um, you know, I'll just say this. Today's complex problems will not be solved in siloized ways. Uh, the institutions, the city, the universities, the healthcare uh, industry, uh, the governments, uh, honestly, I, if you think that the ba our, our way of getting out of all this is just to raise property taxes, uh, don't lose sight of the fact that, you know, my mom and dad are on a fixed income and, uh, you know, every dollar does count to them and I think that's going to increasingly become uh, the challenge. Uh, certainly there's room to uh, grow the uh, residential tax base, but if that's your only answer, I think, uh, you know, back to Peter's iceberg and, and maybe my tsunami, it'll be, it'll be a difficult way forward. So um, with that, I thank you and uh, appreciate this opportunity. Hey. Well, that was fantastic. Um, I have so many questions, but I will contain myself, and I promise you, dear audience, I will leave some time for you as well. Um, to start off with, in the spirit of this intergenerational conversation, I wonder if you could expand a little bit about your hopes for the next generation, in particular, when someone my age is sitting in your chair 20, 25 years from now. Do you imagine a city that runs pretty much the way it does now, or are there differences, adaptations, wow. evolutions you hope to see? So, Selena, I think in your opening remarks about you know the, the world as it's being seen and, and experienced uh, by the millennial generation. I mean, these devices, obviously, you know, but the interesting thing about this device is that none of us in this room, maybe a few exceptions, knows what's actually underneath the glass, <laughs> right? That's my problem. I need to solve what's underneath the glass. I need to make accessing government as simple and if I don't do it, I think in 10 years when the millennial is in my seat and looks at the progress that's been made, you know, uh, in the way in which you can access, you know, city services, if we haven't worked out underneath the glass how to make this thing easy for you. The thing I love about an iPad is, like, if you ever, op if you ever buy one, it's a box and a piece of paper and then the device, it has enough charge to get you going and has no instructions you just use it, and it's almost instant gratification, you know? I mean, I don't think government is all that far away from doing that, if it wants to, you know? Uh, you know, to, to actually provide services that are so easy, to help you in ways that you had no idea that you could be helped, you know, to bring to you the programs before you need to even ask. So, you know, if, if that scene is futuristic, then I, I make this comment at the risk of getting in trouble, but you know, I just can't help it to all my urban planners and city manager friends. You know, I, I, if I compare how we've managed you know, government um, over the last 300 years and compare that to medical science, I mean, think about it. M medical science is, is cracked the human genome. We, we understand, understand brain development in ways that 30 years ago we had no idea. And I, I hate to say it, but sometimes it almost feels from a government standpoint you know, you got a problem, jar of leeches. You know, it's, <laughs> you know it, it's like, why haven't, and, and I don't fault, you know, any of the decision makers in all of this. I, I look at us and, and wonder, you know, because I think in 10 years when you're the city manager and, 
and you want to, and your colleagues start turning to you and saying, you know, you know, why isn't why isn't government easy, you know? And and I'll leave you with this. Uh, I had my business card to give you kind of a, a, a framework or whatever like that, and. I need to sign off to approve it. And uh, I caught it at the last minute. It had a fax number on it. <laughs> so I got rid of the fax number. So if nothing else, there's continuous <laughs> improvement, you know? One of the things that you didn't mention about your prolific career um, is that you're also currently the chair of the Municipal Benchmarking Network of Canada. I don't think there's an of, it's just Municipal Benchmarking Network Canada. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about your views on, on whether policy making in general is keeping up with the pace of technological change, but also the power and peril of big data for government, in your view. Yeah, uh, those are two great questions. So my, my interest in being the chair is that I get to work with pretty much all the city managers of the major cities across the country. And so I get to see what they're doing. So we're benchmarking services against each other. And our staffs are cranking out data. And for a long while there, we were just kind of cranking out data. We weren't getting the intelligence out of it. We weren't picking up the phone or emailing to find out why is someone better at something. And so that was kind of my motivation to get involved is uh, because I'm, I'm telling you, it's not so much I'm a great lover of numbers and, and wisdom that might come from data. It's not so much that I keep coming back to the Mount Everest I want, really want to climb, and that is proving to you we're very good at what we do, mm -hmm. okay? Because I, I think I owe it to the people that I'm working with in this organization that, uh, you know, we demonstrate to you uh, in as many ways as possible that uh, our, our passion for what we do is real. Uh, we come to work every day as civil servants uh, trying to earn your trust and confidence. Uh, that's really what I'm trying to do. And uh, so that's why, that was my motivation. I mean, I look at the, the whole data, and, I, and obviously we're all following Sidewalk and, and the whole, you know, I look at Copenhagen, and I mean, Copenhagen sells data to the private sector. I don't think we're ready for that, but um, someone somehow, some way is gonna crack the data privacy nut, and it's staring right at us. And we're going to have to, with the federal, provincial, municipal government, and the private sector, figure out how this is going to happen because it's not a question of if, I don't think. I think it's a question of when and who does it. The fact that there are parties here that are interested in exploring this is, you know, is a testimony to Toronto and the, you know, vibrancy of this community and the excitement of it. And, and this is a challenge. And, and, you know, there are deep policy issues here that we just cannot ignore, but let's face them. And let's find a way in which to kind of manage that frontier. Because I honestly, as an urban planner, uh, I'd be hard pressed to believe that we're not going to see those neighborhoods in and around this country and around this world in the next decade or so. So uh, it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't necessarily be a bad thing if, if Toronto could somehow figure this out. Mm -hmm. You mentioned a ton of policy issues and really important policy issues in your presentation. I'm going to pick up on just one and assume that the audience are going to pick up on others. But housing. So. Housing is one of the biggest challenges the city faces, as you even mentioned yourself. And before becoming city manager, you were, uh, in Hamilton, you were the city's uh, director of housing. So mm -hmm. tell me a little bit more about what you learned in your tenure in that position and what you bring from that experience to how we need to do things differently in this city. Uh, probably to a lot of people in the audience, they already know this, but I mean, it, it, as a housing director in Hamilton, I had everything from homelessness to, to housing, to affordable housing. So, and, and we use terms like social housing, affordable housing. At some point, I'd just like to call it community housing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, I mean, you, I saw firsthand what happens when the so-called soft services are, you know, depleted. And, and as I said, I think in my speech that, you know, effectively you're warehousing people. And, uh, and, and somehow, I mean, the morality of that, I think, is, is obvious. Um, but if you really need to argue it from a cost-benefit standpoint, I don't think it's all that hard to argue that either. Uh, because there are, you know, uh, there's a million ways to avoid costs if you do the right things at the right time. So mm -hmm. I, I just saw it firsthand. Um, I, I also thought that, you know, our not-for-profit and our healthcare sector in terms of just, you know, someone who's struggling in poverty and you say to them, 
you need to go across town tomorrow at 11 o'clock and, and, and attend this clinic and have this assistance. I don't think we understand what is going on in their bandwidth. When they, that, you know, their world, you know, the things that we take for granted, they struggle with. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that cost of that ticket across the city, sometimes for some people, is the decision to eat two or three meals that day. And, and that's, that's just a fact. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, I, 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 were, I really wonder if we fully understand, you know, what they face and how best to assist with their day to day. And why that, not only from a morality standpoint is important, but even from a, you know, from a, uh, if you want to take a hard nose kind of cost benefit uh, argument approach, I think, I think we had, we had something in Hamilton called Claremont House. Uh, we had basically the most serious uh, people in our downtown who struggled heavily with alcohol. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were drinking things that no one can imagine. And they struggled. They were arrested constantly. They were always part of that system. And then there was a place, and I believe we have something similar to that here in Toronto, but there was a place where basically they were housed and they were given a certain amount of alcohol through the course of the day. But there was, there was a nurse there and there was a health official there to kind of watch them. And, and you know, you want to talk about outcomes. I mean, they interviewed one of the patients and, uh, and they said to him, so what is it about Claremont House? And he said, well, you know, simply, he said, when I used to go to bed at night, I didn't want to wake up. Mm -hmm. Now I do. And so it's, it's that way, it's, you know, for that individual, for that population of people that struggle heavily. I look at our shelter system, you know, it's to the max. I mean, Julie knows it all that well. I, I look at our early years program. I know we have 12,000 people that are waiting for subsidies. You know, uh, the investment you make to children when, and before, you know, preschool to allow them and allow their parents to do the things that they need to do. I mean, the payback on that is massive over their life in terms of, you know, services that they access or don't access because mm -hmm. they've been given that help. You know, having the robust economy, so these people that are in this room that uh, we need to go work for, um, you know, I think is, is critical so that they're not staring at, you know, 20 hours of work here and then another 20 hours somewhere else with no benefits, no pension. You know, I mean... Uh, you know, that, that economic, I mean, I hate for you to have phenomenal education so no jobs to go to. Um, so, and that's, you know, that's what, you, that's what you've told us, so. Great. I have one final question and then I'm gonna throw it out to the audience. Um, I've heard that you're allergic to the idea of personal legacy, so I won't ask you about that, but I wanna ask you about outcomes. What does your idea and vision of success look like at the end of your first year city manager, at the end of this council term, and at the end of your career? Well, at the end of the first year, I'm still employed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> longevity of city managers across the country, I think David is about, what, three and a half years, so. Although I had a 10-year run in Hamilton, we'll see how it works out here in Toronto. But um, the first year is the relationships. Uh, you know, with my frontline staff, uh, with my leadership group, and, and with obviously my, my decision makers, and, and I'll, I'll be laser focused on that. Um, you know, I, I used to do this thing in Hamilton where I, uh, a day in the life, and I started doing it here where I take a half day a month and I go hang out with my frontline. So I've mm -hmm. issued parking tickets, I've dug graves. I've, what, Canadian kid doesn't love driving a Zamboni, I've driven a Zamboni. <laughs> I've put out fires uh, with our fire service. Uh, I was able in, ha in Toronto here to drive a front end loader and I mean people look at you and they think what you know you know what's he doing here <laughs> and I go uh, honestly I just want to say thank you and show you respect because and and oddly enough when I was doing this in Toronto just recently and there's a little clip that will come out to the staff and just to kind of remind them that you know um, you know I care mm -hmm. um, this woman comes up to me and has no idea who I am which is perfect she shouldn't um, she said, I gotta tell you something. I'm going, here we go. <laughs> here comes the complaint. Those guys work so hard. And she says, the summertime when it's really hot and they're out doing their jobs, I make sure that they have water. You know, and if I've made cookies, I give them cookies. I said, well, as long as it's not brownies, we'll be all right. <laughs> but, um, um, but you know what, I mean, and, and, and I bet you if we were to do a survey of our citizens in this town, about the services we deliver, we're probably, they'll tell us something that we're probably far better than maybe we see ourselves. That's the experience I had in Hamilton. So that first year building that relationship, four years, um, 
deeply want to deliver on the priorities that council set. Absolutely. I mean, that's why we're here. Uh, I love making assists. Uh, you know, the goals will be scored by our decision makers. Um, but I love kind of working at the tables that, uh, you know, that you set with the diversity of skills that you have. Uh, I can't figure it out by myself. I know that for certain. But I generally hire people who are pretty brilliant. And uh, we, you know, we argue. You know, uh, we disagree. Uh, if they're agreeing with me all the time, I don't want them. Uh, because uh, talk to Michelle and Hannah and Ben, they'll tell you that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm right maybe 30% of the time, you know. But uh, so that's four years. And in the career, I've always said this, and this is just true. I think if you're lucky enough as you draw your last breath and you're conscious, if you're able to, you're going to think about number one, your family, number two, your friends, and number three, your community. And if you've had a chance to shape your community in the ways that you people are doing, uh, the way that I get to, which is a total privilege, um, that's a phenomenal life. And so, uh, and you have to take seriously these people uh, that are in this room uh, and, uh, you know, make sure that we make those tough decisions and we'll give you the best advice as we can uh, and make those decisions. So, yeah, I mean... Legacy bothers me. I know some people want to be named after something, and I all do respect. That's great. Statues, whatever. Uh, there's a few of us that aren't, aren't built that way. We we're just, uh, it was just the fact that we were able to, at some part of our career, to be in a room and things were worked through. I mean, that's, that's just good, clean fun. So over to you. We have roaming mics. I'd ask that you keep your questions short, refrain from long commentary if possible, and we'll try to make as much time for questions as possible. Yes, over in the front here. Maybe introduce yourself. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Osevoe Itselma, and I am the equi Equity and Employment Lead at the Toronto Youth Cabinet. So we are the people that Chris has been referring to for a better part of this presentation. Mm -hmm. And we'd like to thank you for inviting us to this room. And we're really happy to be with everyone here. Um, my question to you is uh, just in the realm of equity and employment, which is my, I guess, field. My question would be, what would you say are the capacities of the city manager's office or city hall in general in helping to address some of the issues that the youth are facing with um, employment in uh, 2018 and 21st century. So in terms of precarious labor, lack of employment benefits, and that disconnect between finishing post-secondary education and getting into the labor market. So th this conversation certainly started, I think, when, when the work was done and council approved it, and certainly staff have been looking at ways in which this $13 billion budget of ours, you know, a portion of it certainly could be earmarked towards people who might not otherwise get the opportunity. So there's certainly that work that's happening and extending that thinking to other institutions so that we are purposely going out wanting to make sure that people who have invested time in their lives have their education and now are looking for experience that we're gonna start to connect those lives, that experience to the money that needs to be spent in order to acquire the services and goods. So that, that work needs to happen, continue. We need to spread that message, not just to the universities and colleges, but also I think the hospitals, I think is another massive area of opportunity to kind of give you opportunities to, to work. In terms of the precarious em, uh, employment, in terms of the, you know, this, this race to the bottom, mm -hmm. which, you know, all of us are guilty of. And, you know, you can blame government, you can blame whoever you want. I mean, keep doing it. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you continue to want to buy that tube of toothpaste for 25% less. And you think that that's, you know, you know that there is a savings. Well, that, there's not the savings you think. You know, that person that's working in that store at uh, you know, minimum wage and only able to get 20 hours a week and having to work at Tim Hortons for another amount of time, I mean... You know, I mean, honestly, it's, it's you know, how, do, how does the municipality crack that nut? That's where I think the conversation, you know, and to the extent we can do this, I, I'm not going to guarantee you anything. I, I'm, and it's not enough for me to sit here and go, oh, it's a problem, you know, and then, you know, kind of pat myself on the back for saying it. I'm going, 
it's a it's a conversation that I think you know needs to be had with all levels of government. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that there's a free ride that some are enjoying and may, some are prospering prospering hugely on. You know, Bezos is worth over a hundred billion dollars. That's about twenty percent of the world's population. What they earn. So, uh, you know, I, I'm going. You know, I mean. I think that's where, you know, how do you start to redress the inequities? You know, how do you, and I mean, certainly taxes. I mean, there's a way of doing that. You know, so I, I think the other thing too is I think in terms of who we hire and making sure that our organization, 35,000 people in leadership and in the uh, front line, I mean, in terms, make sh making sure that we look like our community you know, in terms of, you know, reflecting our community. And it's not just, you know, in the, in the front line, but also through management. I mean, one of the things that strikes me, um, and one thing I do have some control over is the performance accountability of the organization. And so to put in the PAs of staff, the ones that report directly to me, and then of course people that report to them, you know, uh, a requirement to address this. You know, what have you done in the last 12 months to, you know, make sure that our workforce reflects our community? I mean, that's that's something either you either you're doing it or you're not. Um, you know, and I think that's that's another way in which you can, as certainly as a city manager, require people to, uh, you know, to not just talk about it. So, and then, you know, and I have a lot of faith in the in the institutions and and our own staff in terms of what are we missing. You know, um, I, li I like to think if there's, and there, I know there are other suggestions or ideas that I, our staff would have on this topic that uh, I can rely on. But, you know, it's one of those things, if we deem it a priority, then how are we going to do it? Don't celebrate the plan, only celebrate the results. Have a third party out there in the community to evaluate, are we doing it or we're not? Media, I think, does a good job of holding us to account. Um, and, uh, and I mean, you know, honestly, credit to the media for, you know, you think about Walkerton, just to, not to go off side, but you know, Walkerton, if it wasn't for Walkerton, you would not have the rigor in your water wastewater system that you have. It is council, you know, in, in, in Toronto, over nine years raised rates 9%, almost unthinkable. But the commitment to making sure we had a water supply that not only was of the highest standard, but was built in such a manner to accommodate growth I really wonder if you would see the cranes in downtown Toronto if there wasn't the commitment of council to make the adjustments that it had to make to put the water system in place. So, I mean, that honestly, but should it take, you know, seven lives dying and 2,100 poisoned, you know, to, to think, oh, maybe we should do something about this? Because um, I'm telling you, this problem that we're talking about over here doesn't have quite you know, that Walkerton, although I know in terms of, uh, you know, guns and gangs and what's going on and how many people are dying on our streets in that manner, I mean, you know, that, that is, uh, you know, you would think that that would, and, and, and I know the, and, and I do want to give credit to, uh, you know, we did pay attention to, uh, as the administration, to the, the election and what we heard from uh, certainly our mayor. Um, I think it was very clear about transit and the need to make those investments, very clear about housing. Uh, and, and I think he talked, you know, uh, certainly about rental housing, recognizing that and not everyone's going to be able to afford, you know, even low end of affordable. Um, he talked about his grandchildren. He talked about the next generation. He talked about a line of sight, you know, for everyone in this community to have that future. So, you know, I know a lot of us were focused on the transit, get it built, you know, in the, we're the classic case of, you know, it's supposed to be, you know, build it, they will come. Well, we came, now we need to build it. You know, um, because it's no longer a capacity thing as much as a safety thing. That's what it is. Um, but, you know, I think when he, when he talked about his grandchildren, he talked about that line of sight, I think he's talking about a generational perspective. And I, and I think, you know, this council and, and this mayor and, and this term of council, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be terribly surprised if they want to know exactly where we're at and what we should achieve in the way of outcome. So I'm hopeful. Other questions? There's one over here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Shoshana Sachs. I'm a professor here in the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering. Mm -hmm. So I focus a lot on infrastructure. 
And you've spoken a little bit tonight about our infrastructure need and also the challenges of funding given, for instance, people with fixed income and the challenges of raising income tax. So I guess my question is, we have a lot of things we want to build that cost money. Yeah. Where should we get the money? Well, you know, the, when you have this much development activity occurring and everywhere around the world you've seen, you know, more of, a, of an involvement of the private sector, I, I, I don't quite understand why we aren't exploring, and I, and I get it, I mean, I understand the need to control, um, but at the same time I'm going, you have some of the, you know, the hottest development, you know, uh, on the continent in terms of you know heavy investment and you know and 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 again I mean if it, it, I, I'm not totally aware of what the last four or five years has been in terms of engaging the private sector but I think there are ways in which you can do it um, you know quite honestly it, it strikes me that um, you know they're they're here and they're doing well and for a reason um, I don't know why we don't leverage more of what they can do. Um, inclusionary zoning is something that obviously as a city planner I think about and uh, you know I, I find like in Hamilton section 37 of the Planning Act uh, was irrelevant almost in Hamilton because we didn't have the market but section 37 in Toronto is a big thing um, you know I mean I, I look at that as is that an opportunity to address some of this infrastructure I know how it's structured right now but um, you know, and again, I look at the federal programs. I mean, I look at the transit strategy that they have, the gas tax strategy that they have. Again, I, I think there needs to be an overall strategy, honestly, for cities, you know, maybe even, you know, regions. And again, I'm not talking about another level of government or succeeding from the province of Ontario. I'm basically saying, you know, and, and, and I believe Paul Martin in the 90s talked about an urban affairs agenda. And I know the Toronto Board uh, uh, of, um, uh, Toronto, uh, not real estate board. Anyways, it escapes me. They they've been talking about this regional context, and and, and honestly, I think you got a federal election coming up in like a number of months. Um, that uh, you know maybe there's an opportunity to kind of uh, talk about. I know FCM is very focused on this. So, you know, again, I mean, there's a lot of taxes that come from the metropolitan Toronto census area that certainly help you know, the federal and provincial government, and uh, I think you want this goose that's been laying the golden egg to keep doing it. We have time for one more very quick question. Pedro in the back. Pedro Barada, United Way. So one of the other wonderful things about Toronto is how, in, how, how we have an, uh, an incredibly engaged civil society that hopefully is gonna help you get to your destination and your driving. Um, for us, who hope to be engaged and hope to be part of this, uh, this journey, what do you think we need to do less of and what would you like to see us do more of in terms of helping you with your job? Hmm. Less of, more of. You know what, that's the question I ask all my senior leaders. What would you keep doing, stop doing, and start doing? Um, less of and more of. Um, well, as I say, you know, I think we need to stop celebrating plans and strategies and, and more celebration of actions that actually, you know, benefit people directly. Um, you know, I, I look at, you know, we, when you have so many, you know, I, I, I do think, you know, the tables that you're at and the outcomes that you try to focus on, I think, you know, having specific outcomes to focus on is... It's not just about how much of a certain thing you've delivered, it's really how has it affected people in general, how has it changed lives. So I'd like, I love us to be more outcome. Because I think in the end, when, you, when the community understands what you're trying to achieve and you can prove that you've achieved it, it will, it will give them the confidence that we need to have in them and have in us as, as not-for-profit not organizations and, and for governments. So I, I think... You know, again, it's not good enough just to say we've done so many of this and we've done it at a high quality. We need to kind of say, and here's who's better off and how. Well, this has been fantastic. Great questions. Great evening. I'm inspired. Um, and to close out, I'm going to pass this back to Enid. Thanks, Enid. Well, I just uh, am up here to uh, thank uh, both Chris and Selena uh, for a great afternoon. Um, it's a little different than the sessions we've had in the past with our city managers. Do you think so? Yeah, I can tell from the chuckles. 
Um, one, one of the things that's different is uh, we asked Chris about a moderator, and he immediately said, I want a millennial. And so uh, we immediately <laughs> said, how about Selena? And, and uh, you know, this is the most relaxed city manager event I've ever <laughs> attended uh, because I knew Selena would end it on time, get the questions out. <laughs> just, I, I just didn't have to do the this motion or anything. She just totally took care of it. So thank you so much, Selena. Um, you know, we started out a little bit um, on, on a negative uh, uh, bent, as you said, it's a good thing we're not on the 19th floor because we're all going to want to jump. Uh, we talked about ch climate change and inequality and the plight of the millennials, but I think we ended up on a pretty upbeat uh, discussion. Um, I love the notion of plug and play city services. You know, having city services like your iPad, you just get them, mm -hmm. right? You don't have to think about it. Um, and I like the idea of celebrating plans, not not celebrating plans, we love to plan, but actually doing something and celebrating the actions. And I, and I particularly love your talk of the region, because again, in the city of Toronto, we tend to be very inward looking, and, and, and we are part of a region, and it's an important region, and, and so I really love your focus uh, on the region. Selena asked you where you hope to be in a year, and I thought you were gonna say back here. <laughs> Because we certainly hope that in a year from now, you will come back with a year's perspective and, and, and update us on, on the state of the city. So thank you very much, Chris. Thank you. Thank you Last, um, sorry, to, today, today, I'm supposed to say to, today's event has been webcast and will be available on our website in the weeks to come. So uh, please share it with your colleagues. Look at it again if you're interested. And again, thanks for coming. Have a great evening.